everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Shannon Haddock, and I am a librarian here at the Hoover Library in the fiction department, if you ever want to find me. And uh, today I'm bringing you a program uh, with Kim Waits, who is a good friend, and uh, she works with Wild Alabama. Um, Wild Alabama, it, uh, I'll let you explain, you know, what exactly Wild Alabama is, but Kim has uh, been in and out of uh, the environmental community doing all kinds of things to educate herself, and um, her biography is a bit different. Uh, she came to the environmental scene um, later than most. She, uh, you know, spent a lot of her early years raising a son, uh, very admirable work uh, here in Birmingham. And then once she started volunteering, that led to her new career as an environmentalist, environmental educator. And um, I really admire that. Um, you you uh, have a very eventful um, Facebook uh, life, I see. Uh, we're fr Facebook friends, and it's fun to see the, the trials and tribulations of, of Kim in the mountains. Um, so I'm going to give that over and let her speak to the uh, Leave No Trace organization and ethos. Kim, tell us all about yourself and, okay. and get started. All right. Well, um, as Shannon was saying, uh, my name is Kim and I, I work for Wild Alabama. I, it started off with Wild South in 2014. Um, actually, well, previously to that as a volunteer and it grew into a career, which I totally didn't expect that, but I felt like it was um, uh, prudent of me to educate and um, get as much skill training as I possibly could to kind of live up to this wonderful opportunity. So um, I'm a Leave No Trace Master Educator, um, which means I can, it's the highest level of training that you can get. So I can train people to be trainers. Plus I can also um, uh, conduct awareness workshops, which is what you're experiencing tonight. It's just kind of an awareness. Um, and I'm also a wilderness first responder. I've uh, gotten some other certifications in land ethic, the Leopold um, land ethic, and uh, just whatever I can get my hands on, any kind of professional development. Last year, I um, did a course through the University of Montana, um, earning a wilderness stewardship certificate, learning more about land management and how wilderness is managed um, on federal property, um, which really helps guide our stewardship uh, plans and decision making um, in, in the National Forest wilderness. Um, so um, here I am, and what I'm going to present to you guys tonight is a, uh, a Leave No Trace Awareness Workshop. I have created a uh, Google slide presentation, um, which is going to sort of run itself because um, I don't want to do all the talking. Um, there are so <laughs> many, um, <laughs> although I could if you let me, but um, uh, that's going to kind of guide us through um, the seven principles of Leave No Trace. And um, then there's gonna be some interruption here and there for questions or comments. Um, this is kind of the adult version. Last night I did Leave No Trace for um, a scout troop that was ages six to 12 and they, they got the fun um, uh, child version of Leave No Trace. So, um, all right. I'm not, sometimes I take y'all to the Wild Alabama website. Um, I'm going to, for time's sake, um, let y'all do that on your own. If somebody wants to pop that in the chat at uh, www.wildal.org, um, spend some time on our website. We've got all kinds of cool things. We have events coming up. We have opportunities for stewardship. Um, so it, at your leisure, Sometimes just get on there and uh, go down the rabbit hole. So um, as far as Leave No Trace uh, goes, um, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, outdoor recreation was starting to take off. Um, the invention of lightweight 
backpacking uh, gear and hiking gear and um, awareness of public lands and of, of all the things that um, people could do on public lands started to create, you know, an increase of um, visitation. And of course, with an increase in visitation, an increase in impact um, started to happen. So in, in the 60s, people started using um, qu uh, quips like uh, tread lightly or leave only footprints. And um, uh, sometime around that time, um, people started pushing towards a more formalized ethic. Um, and it uh, kind of grew through the 70s, kind of informally, and then into the 80s. And in 1987, the, in a partnership with the United States Forest Service, National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, um, uh, it started as more of a formal ethic. And then in 1994, Leave No Trace Incorporated as a nonprofit. They're, um, they provide research, education, and initiatives so everyone who ventures outside can protect and enjoy our world responsibly. Um, so all of all of their stuff is based on science. It's based in science and uh, data and data collection. It's it's really not anything that um, somebody just dreams up that <laughs> impact is a problem. Um, there is a entire field of recreation ecology. Um, a gentleman named Jeff Marion from Virginia Tech in, um, in Virginia is kind of one of the uh, spearheaders of the uh, field of recreation ecology. A lot of the research that I do and his methodologies that I do when I'm studying recreation impact is guided by his research. Um, so last year, the, the reach for the National Center was 60,000 people trained and 15 and a half million people reached. Um, just an amazing statistic. Um, so another link here, we won't go to it um, for time's sake, uh, is www.lnt.org. Um, go on there, there's everything from stuff for adults to children. You can do um, awareness, an, an online awareness workshop if you wanna send those links out to your friends or... So one thing that I like to bring to people, um, it's kind of, it's a really important uh, thing that has come up, especially in the spike in social media, um, is that, and this is, if you lead people, if you're a hike leader or a trip leader, or you take your friends into the woods and you want to express the idea of leaving a trace to people, we don't want it to come across is about shaming. Um, you know, l and it's, it's not about shaming. Um, it, L, the trainers and advocates use um, what we call authority of the resource technique to convey a positive message to help shape values and ethics. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to use the word Karen, but we don't want to come across as, um, you know, somebody who's uh, militantly putting out this idea um, we want it to be a very embracing, um, you know, it's, it's basically, it's opposite of authority of the agency. Like, I, I know some people in the Forest Service that won't hesitate to write somebody a ticket for something that they may be doing that's in violation of an ordinance. We don't want that because it just turns people off and it makes people not want to be outside. Um, so authority of the resource technique when learned is the best tool for teaching leave no trace and they have produced this video that we're going to watch each screen is going to have um, a short embedded video one of these days I'm going to have my own videos <laughs> um, so just sit back and enjoy it. And I'm Aaron. We're from the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics. Today we'll be talking about the authority of the resource technique, a great educational tool for dealing with those less than leave no trace moments. We'll also be covering a few of our best practices for effective communication. 
This technique is great for rangers, volunteers, and everyday citizens who wish to educate other people about Leave No Trace in a positive way that's actually going to make a difference. Authority is defined as the power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior. Nature, or the resource, has its own authority to influence our behavior. Because of this, people are actually more likely to enjoy the outdoors responsibly when they understand how their actions impact the natural world. There are three main steps involved in effectively using the authority of the resource technique. Before beginning, it's helpful to establish rapport to open the door. Ask the other person how they're doing, what their day is like, where they're from, if they've been to the area before. This all helps establish a friendly conversation. One, give an objective statement. This can be tricky, but practice makes perfect. We want to avoid placing any blame on the other person. And we want to avoid using any value-laden terms like don't or should or didn't you know. For example, you might say, I've noticed some people hiking off trail, or I've noticed a lot of erosion in this area. Making this objective statement keeps the conversation non-confrontational. Step two, explain the implications or the consequences of the action. This is what we like to call the why. This explanation should focus on the resource, like trees, water, wildlife, flowers, etc., and how the observed action impacts those natural resources. For example, you might say something like, there are many endangered plants in this area that are easily trampled by people hiking off trail. Because there are so many people visiting this area, many of these plants and flowers could be easily lost forever if everyone hiked off trail. Remember, the consequences here should focus on the impacts to the natural world, and not necessarily because it's against the regulations. This helps people understand how their actions impact the natural world. Step three, tell them what can be done to improve the situation. No one likes to receive criticism, however well-intended, without solutions or opportunities for improvement. For example, I'd feel a lot better if everyone stayed on the trails to help protect this sensitive vegetation and to help prevent erosion. These educational conversations are the most effective at inspiring long-term behavior change, but they can be challenging at times. A few of these effective communication tips will help bolster your authority of the resource technique. Come from a place of compassion and treat them as an individual. It's important that we don't make this one person out to be everyone we've seen doing dishes in a river or littering on the trail. It's important that we come into each situation as a new opportunity for education. Orient your body to be shoulder to shoulder rather than face to face. This helps create a friendlier atmosphere and can reduce possible tension in the conversation. Remember, you're both in this together instead of you versus them. Take parents or trip leaders aside to have a conversation if possible. No one likes to be told that they're doing something wrong in front of their kids or participants. Take a minute to collect your thoughts before you approach the person. Plan out the steps of your conversation, especially the why. If you're with the group, brainstorm with them what you might say. The Leave No Trace movement can be strengthened when all outdoor enthusiasts understand how to minimize their impacts. Although sometimes challenging, the authority of the resource technique is a proven framework for having meaningful conversations that truly make a difference to our shared lands. Awesome. Um, so let's give a minute, two minutes for any commentary on this or question or. I am. Um... This is Shannon, of course, and it, I just want to say that a lot of the techniques they're talking about are are generally, you know, accepted ways of confronting people in most situations. How how you want to uh, frame questions and things like that, it's it's very helpful, um, and you know, it, it matters where you are too. Um, I mostly done hiking and camping in Alabama. But when I went out to Montana, I learned that they take it to a whole nother level. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Out, how people care for the outdoors is, is, is like amplified by a hundred out there. Um, so it, it's interesting to see. And this, you know, this, may or may not apply to you on a personal level, but it's just, it's just good to know that, um, and, and that that's what we, my personal philosophy is to be an inviting and uh, compassionate educator and not um, somebody who is judgmental. So, so this next 
um, thing I really wanted to put in there. Um, the Leave No Trace Center after COVID hit did a lot of research on um, trends that were that they were seeing post COVID. Um, you know, when COVID hit. Everybody was saying, well, you got to be outside. Everybody get outside and, um, you know, travel shut down, um, uh, extracurricular events in schools. They didn't have uh, football and soccer and all these things. So parents have been struggling to find activities for their children to do. Um, so the survey that they did back in the um, early summer of last year found that there was a at least a 33% increase in usage on public lands. Um, our volunteers saw it with their own eyes um, and it still continues. And, and one, of the, one of the things that the survey concluded was that people were saying that even when things get back to normal, they wanted to continue getting outside. So, you know, double-edged double sword, it's wonderful that we are getting people engaged and outside enjoying public lands and, and discovering all of those benefits that you can get from ecosystem services and all that good stuff. But we are also seeing that's increased impact and increased footprint. But the bridge there is in our educational efforts is catching those people. It's an it's a opportunistic moment for people like myself and um, yeah, others that let's catch them when they get outside and, um, you know, influence them to re recreate responsibly and do the right thing. So um, I can email this if y'all are interested, but basically this is a um, kind of a COVID version of the Leave No Trace principles. Um, they've popped up on kiosks across the country and on social media platforms. Um, uh, and I think one of the main I think one of the main things, main takeaways of this um, is number four is probably one of the biggest avoid times and places of high use and have a plan B and a plan C because um, some people come out and one trailhead will be so incredibly crowded. It just doesn't even make sense to go down that trail. So have a backup plan and maybe another <laughs> or three. So, um, and I will say that. Um, the website I created, web page I created for this program is hooverlibrary.org slash leave no trace has that link to that resource. Oh, excellent. Yeah, good timing to bring all this up, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, so the next seven slides we're gonna move through and then we're gonna start with um, the, the seven principles of leave no trace. Um, they're all, they move in order, starting with plan ahead and prepare. Um, so we're just going to move through them, and um, there's a short video on each one, about a minute or two long. So the, the first principle, of leave no trace, and probably the most important, everything kind of falls into place from there, and it builds on this one important plan ahead and prepare. <laughs> Much got everything. So you got your your rain gear and warm clothes. I didn't really think it would rain that much. What about your stove? Well, I'm planning on using a fire to cook my food. Well, you at least have your your guidebook and your map, right? No, I'm planning on following the white places along the trail. <laughs> Don't be that guy. Where's where's the next water? Oh. Should be point two. It's just up there. Oh, <laughs> poor guy. Why does it always have to be the guy? You know, bad characterization here. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, this is pretty pretty important. Um, no enclosures. Sometimes it's due to um, a, a, a messed up trail, or it could even be peregrine falcon nesting or something weird like that. Um, always good to call the ranger station. Some One thing that I see a lot on social media is people go to groups and post a, 
um, a question that is so open-ended, you might get eight, 10, 12 different answers when the most definitive answer should come from the managing agency. So I try, if I can, to steer them towards the ranger station and say, call the district ranger station and let them answer your questions. Um, but there, like some of the things I, I will say, some of the things that people ask are more nuanced that only the community that consistently goes out there knows those answers. So it's a blend of both, but um, uh, things on like ordinances and trail closures, probably best to, to make a phone call and then other stuff, you know, it's a, it's a balance. Anyway, um, having your 10 hiking essentials, which is a complete other rabbit hole. I've done uh, webinars on that topic, um, researching that and making sure you have everything that goes in your pack. Um, and then, of course, a map and checking the weather. Um, I know Randy can attest to the fact that he will used to get a lot of calls about things on the Cahab River. And, you know, whereas, you know, if you call down to, you know, National Wildlife Refuge, you're more close to the river, you might get a different answer. So... Mm -hmm. Okay, so leave no trace principle number two. There's actually hand signals for all of these. Um, leave no trace principle number one is to travel on, I mean, excuse me, principle number one is plan ahead and prepare. And then two is to travel and camp on durable surfaces. footsteps can damage our favorite outdoor spaces. You can lessen these impacts by learning to recognize and travel on durable surfaces. In popular areas, stick to designated trails. Walking on already established paths can help protect soil and plants, and can also help protect wildlife who learn to avoid people on trails. Walk single file in the center of trails, even if they're muddy, rocky, or wet, to avoid widening the path. Hiking on undesignated visitor-created trails or taking shortcuts can damage the ecosystem by unknowingly traveling through sensitive habitat. It can also cause costly trail restoration. When hiking off trail, stick to durable surfaces, barren dirt, gravel, sand, rocks, and snow. Walking on leaf litter, pine duff, and dry grasses are also good options. If in a group, fan out widely across the area to disperse footfalls. This helps avoid trampling vegetation and creating new trails. Ferns, wet soils, steep slopes, lichens, mosses, wildflowers, and biological soil crusts can be easily damaged and take very long to recover. Avoid traveling through these areas. By traveling on durable surfaces, you keep our natural lands scenic, ecologically healthy, and enjoyable for future generations. So um, the main thing that I like to um, talk about with this particular principle, and it's probably one of the most imminent issues that we're seeing right now, especially with popularity of um, different places, um, is we, we do have official trails, and then we have what we call user-made trails. And when I say official trails, that means that um, they've been recognized by the Forest Service. They actually have a management plan in place that you are, you are allowed to maintain them, and they are built across sustainable, sustainable paths with sustainability in mind. But then there are other places that are unofficial that um, with the increase in popularity on social media, people are calling them trails, but they're not real trails. And they're very unsustainable, they're very eroded, and they can be dangerous and degrading to the to the environment that it's in. So we sort of have this catch 22 right now that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to educate people that it's, it's okay to go to these places that are off trail. Technically it's public lands and you are allowed to go wherever you desire. Um, but some of these places that need a break, um, I'm, I'm very, prudent about giving locations of places. And I, I used to do it. Like I, I used to go on Facebook and be like, I'm at such and such place and not, you know, but then I've learned over time, the more that we 
hashtag and put it out there, then, um, you know, it's, it's increasing. And I have literally watched one particular place in the Sipsi wilderness go from a beautiful, pristine area to now there's a well-established footpath. There's eroded areas. And, you know, it's, it's, what's the best answer to that? I mean, we do the best we can, you know, we, right. Some, sometimes if I know of an off trail place, um, instead of, instead of approaching it through on the soil, I will walk through the creek bed because I'm trying to avoid walking on the, because there is no trail bed because it's not an official trail. I try and stay off those slopey places that, I mean, not only are they ankle rollers, you know, um, but every time you kick off dirt into the water, then, you know, you're going to cause, there's one place, Parker Falls, that um, I remember when I first started going there, there's like a, a ledge and you could walk across the ledge, but now the because of use, the entire hillside is sloughed off, the trees down in the canyon, and it's just, it's massively eroded, it's unsafe, and I don't know, anyway, that's my rant about that, <laughs> so um, we'll go on to Leave No Trace principle number three. When you've got to go, you've got to go. But when it comes to managing waste, there are safe ways to do this so that you don't pollute the environment. Never miss an opportunity to use a proper toilet facility. Kiwi, wait, wait, wait. Oh, Kiwi, wait a moment. Can you okay? If there are no toilets, be prepared to dig a hole, which is why it's important to bring one of these. You must dig a hole at least 50 metres from a water source and about 15 centimetres deep. When you're done, fill in the hole. Remember, this is only appropriate when tramping in backcountry. Awesome. So yeah, I really wanted to add this one because um, the, the plug is that Leave No Trace has expanded overseas. They have New Zealand Leave No Trace. They have it in Ireland. When I did my master educator course on the Appalachian Trail um, several years ago, there was a guy in my class who had flown, he flew from Ireland all the way to the United States to get his master educator training so he could go back and work with, with that um, I don't know if you call it chapter or what, but um, okay, so leave what you find. The woods are full of beautiful things, such as feathers and flowers. You can take as many pictures, memories, and stories as you want home with you, but leave the physical object behind. Some plants may be rare or endangered, and you should be extra careful to stay away from these plants so they have plenty of room to go forth and multiply. These things are all important to the forest and the animals who call it home. Without them, it would look like an artificial wood in the middle of an amusement park. So leave what you find in the woods for you at Just Visiting. So the hand signal for leave what you find is um, one is the L and then also that is like uh, making a camera. The kids love these. Um, so just a reminder that you can take a camera and capture that moment as opposed to picking flowers and bringing them home. Um, and then, you know, I've struggled with that. Like I was telling Shannon earlier that um, I had found a few arrowheads that I really, it took every bit of internal restraint not to remove that. Not only because it's a $10,000 fine on federal lands, <laughs> there is the, the agency perspective, but the, um, I guess like the spiritual part of it is knowing that for 10,000 years, that particular era had probably sat there in the creek bed that long. And, uh, you know, it just sort of belongs there. You know, that's, that's where the story is um, to me. So... Um, but I'm not judging. If you've got a few sitting on your bookshelf, I'm not judging. I'm not a judger. So. <laughs> that also brings up a uh, point I'll, I'll ask you, Kim. The 
the generation of everybody wanting to catch everything on their phone is causing some trouble because isn't there like it wasn't a sunflower it was some field that like nobody knew about and then Mm -hmm. like one instagram picture just brought like crowds and crowds of people to the field of flowers and you know the owner couldn't keep people off couldn't couldn't you know what i mean that the the yeah this this fever to have everything documented through their camera lens it you know it can be problems they get it's tagged and mm-hmm. I mean, google maps actually calls it, it says parker falls trailhead which there really is no trailhead which creates this ex- expectation for people, oh, I'm going to go there. There's going to be a toilet. There's going to be a kiosk. Everything's going to be blazed. You know, it creates these expectations for people who don't understand how the place is managed. And then they get there and this set, you know, kind of sets them up for some disappointment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've watched places that have hashtags, um, you know, and I, like I said, I, I did it once. And I, the last couple of years, I've gotten in the habit of being really prudent about location sharing or if I say that I'm out I'll be like I'm in the Bankhead National Forest <laughs> so that's 181,000 acres for somebody to find out what waterfall I was at that day you know and it's not that I'm trying to keep keep people out that's never the um I got accused of that once but it, it's never been my intention it's just if I'm going to um be a part of this I want to be able to have these kind of conversations with people before they recreate on public lands you know it's kind of like there's got to be some on-ramping effort for people to get outdoors so they understand Mm -hmm. what the correct behavior is okay so minimize campfire impacts which the hand signal is you you do this like a crackling fire Um, and we're not going to watch the video because it's like four minutes long and it's a boring video of me making a mound fire and I couldn't find a better video to embed in there. So we're going to skip it. Um, but the, the gist of it is that when you're collecting firewood, you want to have um, the four Ds, which is dead down, dinky, and distant. You don't do live firewood for many reasons. Um, consider alternatives, having no fire at all, maybe using a backpacking stove to cook. Um, if you just want the ambiance, you know, some people bring those little tea light lanterns and just put those up um, and then putting your fire completely out, no smoldering. Um, if you can broadcast your old ashes, if they're cold enough, that really helps like our volunteers who go out and dig out fire pits. It, it definitely helps us maintain the amount of ash and coal that's left in a firing, which can be a fire hazard, obviously. So. What? Can you explain dead, down, dinky, and distant? So the the dead is um, that, you know, just be dead wood. Right. Uh, Down on the ground. Dinky means no larger than your wrist, like something that you can snap over your knee or kind of wrap it around a tree and pull it back like that, broken stuff like that. Um, And distant is um, a, a way from your campsite sort of in a you don't want to take it all from the same place because when things decompose um it's it will create little micro uh uh well what am i trying not ecosystems um environments for decomposers and um so you want to be sparing and kind of get it from around instead of one concentrated place um gotcha. sometimes I'll, I'll stop like if i'm gonna hike in and camp a few miles i'll stop along the way every quarter mile grab a few so that way i don't completely um take away from the area where my campsite is so um leave no trace principle number six which is the kids love this one and i, I would stand up to do it but i won't but um, respecting wildlife, you got to do like the little moose horns and you kind of start scratching your feet like row, row. respect wildlife. So 
Do you know these three tips to respect wildlife? One, observe wildlife from a distance. Quick movements and loud noises are stressful to wild animals and can cause them to change their behavior. Avoid critical and sensitive habitats, especially when animals are nesting and rearing their young. You are too close. Your presence or actions cause wildlife to alter their normal habits. Two, never feed wildlife. Animals are skilled opportunists, and when the offer of human food arises, either intentionally or inadvertently, they can overcome their natural wariness of humans. This can lead to food habituation and conditioning, and human food is not nutritious for wildlife and can cause a variety of negative health impacts. Three, store food and trash securely. Store food, trash, and smellables, including toiletries, in a secure place away from animals. Animals will be attracted to anything smelly and will eat waste, such as plastic bags and food wrappers, which can become trapped and clog the digestive system. Together, we all can respect wildlife and leave no trace. So one, one personal confession, uh, my very first hike with Wild South in 2007 or eight, maybe, with Janice Barrett leading, um, we were at a waterfall somewhere out in the Bankhead National Forest, and I'm sitting there, and I said something about, well, I'll just toss my banana peel over there on the ground. This is before any Leave No Trace training that I'd had. And she called me out right there on the spot and said, food scraps need to come out. Um, everything needs to come out. And, 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 you know, naturally in my mind, I was thinking, oh, well, it decomposes, but it can habituate animals to come foraging in places where they shouldn't be. And it just kind of creates um, a problem. So part of respecting wildlife is packing out your, your trash and your scraps mm -hmm. so you don't habituate. And, you know, it also it's like visually, the majority of people want to see a natural environment and they don't want to see orange peels. They don't want to see your food scraps, you know, um, so it's, it's an aesthetic thing too. I will say that when we were out in Montana, that it also can, if, if you're with an outfitter, it can affect their ratings and their ability to do business in whatever wild area you're in because they are responsible for leaving it pristine mm -hmm. so you not following those rules might affect their business if you're true. with an outfitter um and uh, this is something we run into all the time you know the the uh issue of dogs off leash which you know i, I understand wanting to let your dog run like <laughs> I used to have a dog and if I couldn't get him out and let him get his wiggles out you know but what ends up happening there's it's on so many different levels um it it can disturb the wildlife um it can disturb other people I was attacked by a dog in 2014 and I still have issues sometimes with unleashed dogs coming down the trail and they're bounding up to you like you know they're some have been aggressive and I literally had panic attack. Um, so the, the best practice when you're on public lands is to have your dog leashed and also pack out your dog's poop. Um, right now in wildflower season, you know, I think of all these beautiful little, I've seen Dutchman's breeches and trillium and trout lilies. And when I think of dogs unleashed pooping off on the side of the trail and then they want to scratch you know some trilliums take eight years to bloom and some of these sensitive wildflowers that are popping up right now you know it one poop from a dog and you've lost however long however many years it took for that patch of wildflowers to be at its best so um that is the best practice i i believe is keeping your dog in some places it it used to be an ordinance in the Sipsy and then it expired and they never redid it. So, um, and bringing binoculars, that's a good one. Taking pictures, preserving the moment, sketch. And last but not least is um, be considerate of others. And the, the hand signal for that is you, you do like peace out, 
and wave or something like that. So it's that guy again. <laughs> Out here. Yes. It was. Yes, and that has happened to me. At, when I camp, I, I either go way far. I know some campsites that I know I'm not going to be disturbed, but about three months ago, I camped on Borden Creek and somebody hiked in at nine o'clock at night and they had their music going until two o'clock in the morning and it was. Um, it took every bit of me not to say anything. Um, so we have a thing of observing kind of an understood quiet time, like hiker midnight is generally 7 p.m. Um, you know, if you're, but if you're on the trail just for a day hike, you know, if, if you have to have music, which I would hope that somebody would be listening to the sounds of nature, um, you know, use headphones. I've, I've ran into people on the trail that had Bluetooth speakers hanging from their backpack. Um, don't talk on the phone. It's not going to happen in the, in most of the Bankhead National Forest because you're not going to have cell service, but some of your local preserves like, uh, Ruffner Mountain or, um, Red Mountain Park, you know, that's, for some people, that's as close as they can get to an outdoor experience. You know, they're, they, they're not going to be able to drive two and a half hours to a wilderness area. So we want to try and be as respectful as we can, um, even in our local preserves. Um, and then just yielding to other hikers, do the best you can to let people go around. Um, and if you have to step off trail, you know, if you can step up on a rock, if that's possible, um, just be very mindful of what your steps are doing when you have to step off trail. Um, so, I mean, that, that's basically it. Like this is mainly common sense, you know, um, some of the things that are a little bit more dynamic I've had to think through before and um, I've had some discussions with people about certain things and um, that's that's basically the gist of it. It is um, but so very important. Yes. I'm really. To... So at quarter 14 minutes till the hour um, I usually close with you know, questions, stories, clarifications, um, you know, if you have any pressing question as to like, well, why is this not allowed? Or why is this a problem? Or, you know, um, I can do my best to answer that. Um, if you have any stories you want to share, usually the younger kids love to tell their stories, but even the adults um, or clarifications. So I'm just going to open up. I'm going to touch my mouth and um, I would like to hear from you guys. Anyone? I, I can feel the silence. I tell you, don't even get me started. <laughs> um, when, we've Linda? Been, when we've been hiking, we've always brought a plastic bag or three to pick up everyone else's trash. But since COVID, I've, been more leery about picking up stuff. Do you have yeah. any, I mean, just carry hand sanitizer and towels with you or what, wear, I don't want to wear gloves when I'm hiking. So what we've done with our volunteers that, it, um, you know, picking up trash in, in the age of COVID um, is I carry, you know, latex gloves or just gloves in general. And if we have to pick up trash, you know, we use, the gloves to put it in a bag and uh, put it in like a Walmart bag and then put it in a bigger 13 gallon bag um, and then hand sanitizer um, repeatedly. Um, and so we just in the last month started, I don't think we did any roadside pickups until just about a month ago. Um, and, uh, but we used trash grabbers, you know, so you can pick it up from three feet away. I actually have a 
12 foot long trash grabber that I found on the internet a couple of years ago, which I've, I've used that to get things out of weird places. Um, but we also, we don't do any kind of, we don't pick up poo-poo paper or anything with any kind of body substance, stuff like that. They are strictly, our volunteers do not pick up anything that would have any kind of body substance on it. That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. And, um, I've know, I know that there have been really positive trends, um, mostly I've seen on social media, of people finding themselves in a natural environment and it is just wrecked. And they will take the time to, you know, really clean up the area and more power to them. I, you know, take as many pictures of yourself with those full gross garbage bags as you want to, you know. Um, that's great. And hopefully if enough people do that, you know, but it does take each individual's decision to not drop that stuff on the ground in the first place. So, yeah. And, you know, we've, we've seen a trend, the trend has shifted in the kind of trash that we pick up since COVID. Like I'm before COVID, it seemed like most of trash was like concentrated in a firing like people go out and camp and then they just trash out. They think the firing is a trash can. But I've seen more just random tosses from people that just are coming out for day hikes or something. And I, I don't know who in their right mind would think it would be okay to just toss something as they're walking. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing more of the whole, you know, one and done toss the Gatorade bottle kind of trash, you know? Yeah. It's an interesting thing, but. Well, I sure do appreciate this um, in-depth look at what, you know, common sense is something not all of us are born with. So hopefully this will reinforce and give people ammunition to spread the word, the good word. Yeah. So, yes. And okay. um, thank you so much, Kim, for your time. Mm hmm um, I have a yeah. quick question, please. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I have a tendency of being rushed by loose dogs. Um, I don't know if it's me or the dog, but uh, <laughs> what's the best way to defend myself against some loose dog appearing out of nowhere? You know, I, I, if it's a random dog, and that's happened to me before, um, I, I carry mace, you know, or I have a hiking stick, you know, you just have to do your best. Um, and just nope. I, now, when I was attacked, that was not on public lands. That was actually in a private neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so, could I be held responsible if I say beat the crap out of somebody's dog that rushes me? Could their owner hold me responsible? Lord, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're defending yourself, I mean, I, I'm like I can't speak for the law, but. I, I would imagine that if you're defending yourself, you have every right to defend yourself, you know? Um, and they, they do say like, if you're in a bear attack, um, it, there's, it, it kind of differs what kind of bear situation, the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear, they're different behavior patterns with those two species. But they say with, with any kind of attack, you just, it, 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 if everything you've done is not working, you have every right to just go for the throat. I mean, do everything you can, block your face, block your neck, block, block any uh, major arteries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no, the good thing is the, the dogs that I have ran across by themselves unleashed um, have mainly been over in um, Talladega and they were hunting dogs with mm -hmm. collars on that had just sort of wandered and one was like a beagle and he was the friendliest thing in the world, you know, and I'm just, I was, I saw the little GPS collar. I'm like, well, the owner will catch up with them at some point, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, um, I also mm -hmm. have a question or I have a couple of questions, so that's okay. Sure. Um, the first one is um, just, I guess, a, what you um, 
think is best I, uh, during the summer i know um uh the bugs get uh kind of scary and mm -hmm. I, I, I am a novice hiker and just started really um but certainly last summer i would use um you know whatever grade bug spray i could find at um you know uh the academy or whatever um like and sometimes they were aerosols which you know i now that i think about it, it's probably not the best um what do you suggest or, uh, you know, recommend people do about something like that? So I use um, permethrin, which is something you can soak your, you can wash or spray into your clothes. Some people you can wash it into your um, uh, laundry um, or what I, I usually use the spray kind um, and I'll pull out my, my clothesline behind my cabin and lay out, hang up all my clothes, spray them profusely with permethrin. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can put that in the, I'll put that in the chat, spell it out. Um, yeah, I, I just took screen sharing down so we can, we can have a better yeah, conversation. We're getting about that. Um, so, the, and that's good for ticks and uh, mosquitoes and bugs and, it doesn't smell real bad like the other aerosol kind of stuff. Um, especially if you're on a group hike with people, sometimes that can be intrusive. Like I've had, I've seen people step out of a car for a group hike and the first thing they do, they're like, Whoosh, and it's like wacky yeah. bug spray. And I, I, my throat, I have, it just starts to close up immediately. Um, so my suggestion is to soak, soak your clothes in permethrin and then you don't have to spray yourself down. But then I'm also the nerd that wears long sleeves and long pants in the summertime because um, I don't like to wear sunscreen, but I wear really loose fitting, um, lightweight moisture wicking kind of stuff. Um, so. And that has become so more widely available. It didn't used to be. The wicking, um, mm -hmm. that you can wear long sleeves and actually enjoy your, you know, Alabama summer. But yeah, there's there's different grades of um, of ammunition as far as bugs. You know, there's uh, w natural versus deep versus you know, so yeah, and that's it's, it's a great habit to get into because the ticks, um, you can even get them in winter. I um, and you don't want tick borne diseases. Um, so I'm I'm more afraid. Of getting bit by a tick than I am running across a snake on the trail. If Agreed. I run across a snake on the trail, I'm like, oh, look at that. Cool. It's a Midland water snake. That's awesome. But a tick gives me the heebie jeebies all day long. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And I also had one more question. Um, sure. Uh, I recently uh, took a hike and I kind of went out there and prepared and everything. Um, but um, the trail that I kind of chose to go down was one that I found through just surfing on the internet and finding a uh, the location of an archaeological site. Um, there was nothing, and this was specifically at the um, the uh, the Sipsi Forest or or the the Bankhead Forest. Um, there was nothing on the website that said, you know, um, oh, don't come here or avoid this place or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering if there is any kind of like um you know ethic as far as like um like you mentioned about sharing certain you know off trail spots um is there any harm to um those marked locations for example um, well to seek them out you know i will say that if you if you hashtag certain sensitive places looters uh, so the other day i was paddling on the city fork and i'm just Gonna, I'm looking at everybody like, you don't look like poachers. <laughs> and I ran across an endangered turtle or threatened turtle, a healthy population of threatened turtles. And I texted, uh, you know, uh, Brandy and Shannon, you probably know Joe Jenkins. You know, I texted Joe and I'm like, this is where, I, with my satellite messenger. And, and the first thing he said was like, don't you dare put that on Facebook because of poachers. Um, so he, he just, it's it's a different level of thought when you think of um, some of these places like 
my my coworker actually a few years ago I had gone into a place in the bankhead and there was a mortar stone and I went and I posted it on Facebook and I said the area that I was in and she immediately texted me and she was like will you please take that down because you know somebody with bad intention could probably go in there and with a sandblaster or something and take that mortar stone out off of that boulder and take it home with them you know so you're always risking the bad action when you put it on social media. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, how, how about if, if we, sorry. Um, if you're we know good. That, uh, I love it. If, if we are uh, poachers, um, but is there something unethical or maybe um, just about seeking the places, say, you know, um, this specific place was just, um, there were some rock mounds that I read about on the, like, mm -hmm. um, some mm -hmm. government, like, you know, scans on the internet. And I really wanted to go see it and take some photos. Um, is, is it unethical to go seek those places? A absolutely not. I think it's, um, it's, it's a very interesting way to connect, a very genuine way to connect with um, the past and um, to honor, especially if it's indigenous peoples, um, you can see that area in its context um, and witness it for yourself. As long as it's left undisturbed, um, it is is a very genuine way to to look at something that um, you know that was there before us and, and honoring it for sure. Well, we're heading up to the seven o'clock hour and. Uh, I like to make things even, and it's nice to uh, to have you here, Kim. Thank you so, so much. And um, as I've become aware, you do these things uh, to all kinds of groups. So if you need any kind of contact information for Kim, just let me know. And um, hopefully this will arm us with better intentions to recreate responsibly. Yes, and uh, one quick plug, I'm about to start what we're going to be calling the stewardship challenge. Um, you know, we seeing, we're seeing all these outdoor challenges like the hiker challenge, the waterfall yeah. challenge. Well, my answer to that is going to be the stewardship challenge where we're going to challenge people to come out and do a day of um, stewardship. And then you got to go back and tag people on Facebook and say, okay, it's your turn to go do some stewardship and see if we can't get some momentum going with that. So be looking for that. And if you can't find an organization, call the library. We can give you, you know, the names and contact information for tons of organizations you can do that with. Right. Thank, well, thank you guys you so for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to share this with people. And if you have any questions, email me. Um, I'm going to put in my email here and, or look me up on Facebook. Um, so and check All out. Right. Thank you so much, everybody. Good evening. Bye.